anyway. So the Sefer Torah is going to be put back Shabbos morning, and then we're going to have Musaf. Musaf is an additional, an additional amida which is added into the tefillah. Whenever we've got something very special going on, we have a Musaf. It, it corresponds to the additional offerings that were offered up in the temple. Uh, so we have Musaf on Shabbat. We'll have Musaf on Rosh Chodesh, which in Mitzvah Hashem will be on Sunday. And we've got Musaf on Yom Tov as well. There is no Musaf on Purim and on Hanukkah because those were festivals that were mandated by the rabbis and not by the Torah itself. Uh, however, just to confuse everybody, within Hanukkah there's a Rosh Chodesh, which means that you will have two days of, or one, one day or two days, depending on the year, of, of uh, having a Musaf. It just depends on the day of Hanukkah, right? Hanukkah begins on the 25th of Kislev, so at some point towards the end, it's going to be Rosh Chodesh, and then you'll have a Musaf. The Musaf has got to do with Hanukkah. It's to do with, uh, it's to do with Rosh Chodesh. Um, Musaf followed by all kinds of bits and pieces. Shir Shoyom in most places. En Kelokeinu, Aleinu. And that's the end of davening. Everybody, of course, is very happy because now they can go home and eat. Um, the, uh, you need to know something which is rather important. You should not eat before you have made Kiddush. Can you drink? Huh? Can you you drink shouldn't water? really be drinking. Can you drink water? I mean, I try to stay away from this stuff because I prefer my liquids to have chemicals in them and, uh, you know, coloring and all kinds of bits and pieces. Um, but if you, if, you know, if you want to drink water, you can drink water. You've got to be careful a little bit about what you do drink. It's interesting. Uh, some people like to drink before davening because davening is quite long. And, uh, you know, if they've drunk something, then they're going to be a little bit more focused than they would have been otherwise. Uh, for some people, it's a lost cause anyway. <laughs> and being focused during davening is forget it. So you don't need to, you don't need to drink. Um, according to many authorities... You should avoid, you know, some people like to drink a cup of coffee or something, maybe a cup of tea uh, before going to Daven. Uh, according to many authorities, you should try to avoid putting milk inside of it, which means that a drink without, hot drink without milk is considered to be less substantial than a drink with milk. Once you've got a drink with milk inside of it, there, it runs into the possibility, bless you, it runs into the possibility perhaps of having to make Kiddush before you drink it. There are many authorities, many poskim who rule that it's okay to drink the drink with milk, just don't put too much in. Right? So if, you, if somebody enjoys like a lot of milk and a little bit of coffee, then that's something that you should try to avoid drinking before davening begins. And you should try and avoid drinking something like that before you make Kiddush. Now, making Kiddush means that you can make Kiddush in shul. you got to eat something when you make Kiddush. Right? What do you need to eat? So you don't have to eat... You don't have to wash and eat hamoitzi over there. We spoke about this, I think, at some point. It's, <clears throat> I have some kind of a memory. But you do need to eat mazonas, at least a, minimum amount, a minimal amount of mazonas in order to have turned the place that you're making kiddish into the place that you're eating, something which is like a meal. Right? <clears throat> Aloha says kiddish b'mokam suda that you need to make a suda where you're eating. The definition of a suda is eating a minimal amount of mazoinus. That's a very minimum suda. And that way you're fulfilling your obligation. So, you go to shul, and there's a kiddish after shul, and you want to go into the kiddish. You can definitely go in. Somebody will probably make kiddish over there out loud. You can answer, I mean, you do not have to drink any of the wine in order to have fulfilled your obligation to hear kiddish. You'll see lots of people, you know, as a person makes kiddush, you'll see lots of people trying to fill up their wine cups and have a little bit of wine from the, from the kiddush that was made by the person making it. You don't have to do that in order to be considered to have fulfilled your obligation. It's enough to have heard kiddush. And then you need to eat some mazonas in order to fulfill that part of your obligation as well. Now, what is mazonas? It could be anything, really. It can be crackers, it can be pretzels, it can be cake, it can be biscuits, it can be uh, even, even kugyul, xiaomi. Right? Herring, herring. Now, you know, I tell you, it's an interesting thing. What, what bracha do you make over herring that's sitting on a cracker? Well, for Reb Moshe, it sounds like it might be a bit of a problem over here. Because for most people, I would say that you probably make a mazonas because the cracker is the, uh, you know, the cracker is a pretty important dimension of what's going on. To me... It sounds like Reb Moshe is only using the cracker as a vehicle to get the herring, right? So if that's the case, then you should make sure to eat mazonas 
Some, take something else, right? Take a cracker without anything on it. Take a, take a biscuit, take a, you know, a piece of Jerusalem kugel, whatever you want. Make a mazonus, and then you can make a shahakol over the herring. Right? Um, and then you've got to, be, got to be careful when you finish your kiddush, you've got to be careful to make a brocha achrona before you go home, right before you leave the place where you've eaten the kiddush. If you ate mazonis, which means you have to make an alamichia, you have to add in the extra little piece over there that's referring to Shabbos, and then you can go home and make your suda. Like we spoke about the other day, it's coming back to me slowly but surely. Um, once you get home, if everybody at home has heard kiddush, you don't need to make kiddush in order to, bring, to, to begin your meal. Question. Everybody can just wash, yeah. When you said you don't have to get grape juice, even though you didn't fulfill the obligation of, of Kiddush, yeah, the answer to me. Isn't there a problem like the answer to me to Bracha that you're not having any of that food? Um, no, uh, interestingly enough, no, it's not. Because first of all, the person who's making Kiddush is being, he's being yeah, moitzi, he's being moitzi everybody, right? He's fulfilling everybody's obligation over there. And, and you don't have to answer a main, uh, sorry, you don't have to have something in order to be a partner within the bracha that's being made, yeah. right? Um, interestingly but enough, by the way, you do have to say amen. yeah. Interestingly enough, the Gemara says something absolutely startling, which goes against logic. Uh, goes against our logic anyway, which I imagine is why the Gemara says it. Right. Um, <laughs> so the Gemara says that there is more reward given to the person who answers Amen than to the person who made the bracha to begin with. Which is a very strange thing to say, because you would imagine, right, that the reason, you're only answering Amen, this person wants to eat an apple, right? So he makes a bracha, you're only answering Amen because he wanted to eat the apple, which means without his wanting to eat the apple, you can't say Amen. So why on earth are you getting more reward than the person who's causing this whole thing to happen to begin with? Are you with? There are a lot of blank faces out there. Well, yeah, is that? Huh? Um, um, well, we'll get to, in a second. Just well, one second. Yeah. We'll get to. I just, I just want to finish up with this. It is. Is that, do you understand? Yeah, you understand yeah. the? Bro well, yeah. Why, 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 just, he's getting more credit. For but he's getting some credit for something which does, it doesn't seem logical, he's right? The prayer. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, answer, the answer is something absolutely very, it's very, very fascinating. The person who's making the bracha is getting something out of it, right? Which means that I'm making the bracha over the apple, I'm going to get to eat the apple, right? If I'm making a bracha, <coughs> bless you, okay. over a piece of cake, right? Then I'm, I'm going to get that piece of cake. The person who's answering amen is doing it completely altruistically. He's not getting anything out of it, right? He's not going to get a piece of apple, he's not going to get a piece of cake, unless the person is very kind and generous, which is reasonably unlikely. Um, no, we, we're, our Jews are very kind, generous people, just not when it comes to giving away their food, that's all. Why, of course. I mean, you know, you never know, you, you might need it. I mean, it's like, you know, you might be stuck on a desert island somewhere at some point. I need to eat this piece of cake right now, because if I don't, you know, I may not have enough energy to, to uh, eat the next piece of cake. Whatever, you know how it goes, right? Um, but, so the idea, the idea of answering a name is really, it's really very fascinating. The more altruistic you are, the greater your, uh, the greater your reward is going to be. So if you answer Amen and you're not getting anything out of it, therefore your reward is greater than the person who's actually making the bracha. Does the word apply also by general brachas but don't apply to food? Um, does it apply for, I mean, the Gemara, the Gemara makes an unconditional statement, oh, okay. which is, you know, God la oine, that, that you, you're getting more reward for saying something than you are for you're, you're getting more reward for answering than you are for saying, which so I imagine I applies. And, and yeah. Your, your explanation when it comes to food. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. He's getting something out of it from food, whereas the other person is not. That's yeah. So let's say morning brach is right. Yeah. And you know you're ne next. Oh, time. but he, you know what? Hold on a second. I don't know. I, I think it. I think it works the same way. Actually, you have an obligation to say the morning brachas, right? So you're getting something out of it by saying them. I've already said my morning brachas. But I'm going to answer Amen to all of your brachas, which means I'm doing this for completely, completely the shame shemaim, right? The word, you asked about the word Amen. The word Amen is a, is a very fascinating word, actually. The word Amen, say Chazal, say the sages, it's an acronym for Kel Melech Ne'eman, right? God faithful king. Using, not, not Kel, using the word El Melech Ne'eman, right? Which you see at the beginning of the Shema, for somebody who's not dominating with a minion, so they should, dab, they should say those three words at the beginning of the Shema. What, what's Pshat? The word Amen, I think, normally is translated as verily, which I think is a wonderful word. I've got no idea what it means. <clears throat> I think you have to be somewhat biblical 
to understand what verily means in English, but it means so be it, right? Or truth, whatever you want to say. Uh, there's an interesting little bit of halacha with regards to reciting the word Amen. Right? There's a... God... Oh, yes, you know what? Thank you. I didn't, did, I didn't try to say that, did I? God, faithful king. You're right. Thank you. Um, the, the, uh, the, uh, there's an interesting bit of halacha with regards to the word Amen, that when you recite the word Amen, you need to say it in the same amount of time it would take you to say Kel Melech Ne'eman. Right? Which means that you should not, you should not sort of just get one Amen like that. Why don't you say Kel because the emphasis is like this, that the, the, the word Amen means so be it, or it's true, right? Which means that when somebody makes a bracha, it's true. Or both of them together. Huh? Or both together. So be it, it's true. Or both together. Yeah, yeah. Those right? the three ways of saying it. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. But the, uh, the, the inference behind it, though, is that God, faithful king, which means that, you know, why, why are we saying that this is true? Because God is our king, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that you need you need both of them. You need both of the ideas. That you need that you need the simple shot of amen, which is it's true. Whatever has just been said is true, but you need to understand why you saying it's true. It's because God is our faithful King, right? Kel Melech Neeman, and that's why when you come to recite the word amen, so you need to you need to uh, say it in the amount of time that it would take you to say Kel Melech Neeman. Again, we're not talking about a long time. It's not like you have, you're not just like you know. Oh, <laughs> I mean, unless it takes you that long to say Kelmelech Neymar, but if that's the case, you probably need to practice a little oh, bit, you mean, I think. You mean the time it takes until you say it, or how long you say Amen for? How long, how long it would take, you need to say Amen for how long it would take you to say the words Kelmelech Neymar. Oh, man. Yeah. That's all. Okay, but, but there's also like, you can't wait too long before you say Amen as well. Oh, it's two different things. Yeah. No, no. Uh, hold on a second. Just, just, I'm talking about just with regards to saying, saying the word Amen itself, right? You're right. You should answer Amen immediately after you've heard the bracha. Not to wait too long. Or to say too early. You oh, if you say it too early. I once had an interesting, I once had an interesting idea. One of my Rebbe in London, he said like this. He says, why are Jews fat? Of course, I'm speaking only for myself. Don't, don't, don't uh, you know, please don't take this personally in any way whatsoever, he says. But why are Jews fat? He says, because you get to the last bracha in the Amida and it says, is amo yisrael bashalom, that God blesses his people with shalom, with peace. And as the chazan starts reciting shalom, gets to the shin, the whole of the community is in such a hurry, they already answer amen. And he ends up reciting, it sounds like, is amo yisrael bashamen. Right, that Kodesh Baruch Hu blesses his people with fat. <laughs> so he says that if we would, if we would just, if we would just wait a moment, we would all lose weight drastically, <laughs> drastically, radically. I'm telling you, it would be the most incredible thing. Uh, but of course, that's that's it's not conceivable to imagine that you know asking Jews to wait and yeah. But you need to, you do need to wait. You need to wait until the bracha has been recited entirely before you answer Amen, and you need to answer Amen. As quickly as possible after you've heard it. I knew you were funny. I didn't know you were that funny. What if, hey. Rabbi, what if you're giving us some kind of a serious type of so we should have nachos and this and that? People say amen. Oh, for sure. That's a so wonderful that's thing not, to that's say. That's not a bracha. Brachas come in all different shapes and sizes, which means brachas don't necessarily have to have the formula of baruch ata Hashem. Right? When, when somebody, somebody says to you, no, you should have nachos from your children and from your grandchildren, you say, say amen. And me, you should mean it, for sure. There's even a phrase which is used, Amen v'chein lemar, and the same to you. By the Svadim, they don't say v'chein lemar, they say v'chein lemor, because the word mar means bitter, even though it just means the same to you, so they try to avoid any kind of misunderstanding. But v'chein lemar, it's a very beautiful idea. You know where it's based? It's based on a Gemara. There's a very cute Gemara. It says like this, that there was once a Gemara Megillah, I think, there was a one, once a, one of the rabbis came to visit his friend, and he wasn't wearing his regular belt. He was wearing a belt made out of reeds. Grass. So he said to him, where's your belt? So he said that he didn't have any money to buy Kiddush wine on Shabbos, for, for Shabbos. So he pawned his belt, and he used the money to buy the wine. So his friend says to him, I give you a bracha that you should, one day you should be covered in clothing. You know, it's like a bracha that's applicable to somebody who doesn't have enough clothing here. Right? So the fellow said, Amen. End of Act 1. Anyway, this poor person 
was marrying off his daughter. That's not, I don't mean he was a poor person because he was marrying off his daughter, although there probably is some kind of a connection between the two because marrying off daughters is rather expensive. But the, the poor person who was poor before and had pawned his, his, his belt was marrying off his daughter and he came to the wedding and he was very tired and just before the wedding he decided that he was going to have a little snooze. So he lies down on one of the beds in, in the, you know, in the, off, the, off the, one of the rooms over there where the wedding is going to take place. And the Gemara says he was a very short person. And he went to sleep and his daughters and daughters-in-law came to the wedding, not seeing him in the room, bless you, bless you, not seeing him in the room, they took off their coats and they threw them on the bed. Anyway, he woke up a little while later, completely covered in clothing, right, covered in all of these coats. No, listen, there's more. So the, uh, the person, remember the person who gave him the bracha, what did he tell him? He gave him the bracha that he should be covered in clothing. So the person who gave him the bracha came to him and he said to him, listen, he says, you, you're not Beseda, you know, you, 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 it wasn't right what you did. So he said, why? He says, because when I gave you that bracha, you should have said, Amen, the chain lemar, and the same to you. I see that my bracha came to fruition, right? In order for a bracha to work, it's got to be given in the right frame of mind and it's got to be received in the right frame of mind as well. So he says, when I gave you that bracha, obviously it was given in the right frame of mind and received in the right, if you would have said, Amen v'chein lema, the same to you, then the bracha would have rebounded back onto me. And I could have got some of it as well. But he tells him, he says, you're not, you're not Beseda, right? You should answer, Amen v'chein lema. So I think, it's, as the truth, it's a very beautiful idea, it really is. Because the idea of, of, of including people in something, yet you've been given a blessing to include other people inside of it as well. The Maharal says that the word brocha comes from the word bet, resh, chof. Bet in gematria is two, resh in gematria is 200, and chof is 20. He says they're all multiples. The idea of a brocha is something which it doubles itself. It, it just it grows and grows and grows. A little bit like a snowball effect. You know that somebody gives you a bracha and it gets bounced back and bounces backwards again. And it's something which can grow and grow and grow. Um, in, interestingly enough, the bachor. Is anybody here a firstborn? Does anybody here have parents who, who admit to you having been born at all and not being found under a stone somewhere? <laughs> The, the, uh, I don't know if you know the halacha, but when a firstborn son receives a double inheritance, the word for a firstborn son is a bechor, bet, chof, reish. Same letters as a brocha, bet, reish, chof. Firstborn or firstborn son? Firstborn son. Oh. No, I'm sorry, he's got, he's, got to be, he's got to be the firstborn and he's got to be a son. Oh. That's, right? that, is okay, that, yeah. that's clear now, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so the, uh, it's interesting, bet, chof, reish are also these multiples of two. Bet is two, chof is 20, reish is 200. The idea of double inheritance is found with inside the letters of the, you know, the, the status of the boy himself. Um, how do we get onto that? I really don't remember. But, 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 the bracha grows. And of course, that's why it fits in so beautifully with Shabbos. No, Did I get away shalom. with that? Shabbat yeah. Shalom. Yeah. Oh, we're on Wednesday. Very yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. When, we, when we say Kiddush, we say Amen. The oh, says, thank amen. you. Okay, we got there finally. Yeah. Make the connection somehow. I'll have to work on it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you can, so you can say Amen to the bracha that somebody else is making. He's fulfilled your obligation. You're done, right? And uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to drink from the wine, but you do have to eat. And like I said before, when you go home, if everybody has heard Kiddush, then you don't have to make Kiddush again when you get home. You can just sit down and you can wash and sit down and begin your meal. If there are people at home who need to hear Kiddush, you can make Kiddush again, even though you've heard it already. Even if you were the one that made Kiddush in shul for everybody else, you can still make Kiddush again. And if needs be, multiple times. Uh, who was it? Somebody, somebody told a story about the, the Chabad rabbi who made Kiddush, oh, I think, right, who made, he made Kiddush five times or something one Friday night because people kept coming in every time. Every time he began Kiddush, somebody else came in and uh, so he had to make it again. It's absolutely okay, perfectly okay to fulfill people's obligations over and over again. Um, There's not much No, absolutely not. If you're fulfilling that the other person has an obligation, right? So you're fulfilling their obligation to be able to, to, be able to hear Kiddush and to be able to eat 
on Shabbos. So that's it. The important thing over here is that you're not supposed to eat until you have heard Kiddush. Some people do have the minig. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I, I'm, I don't subscribe to this. I'm actually, it's one of the few things that I'm against. So this might be a, a, a moment to treasure over here. You know, normally I'm, I'm very flexible and I'm very pluralistic and, and whatever you say is normally okay by me, especially if you're bigger than I am. But mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I, I don't think people should eat before davening. I really don't. Although some people do have the custom to eat a piece of cake or something before they, uh, before they go off to daven on Shabbos morning. What do you mean? Um, or drink? Huh? You can't. You just said you can't. Well, it says like this. If, if, you're, if, if a person feels that they're not going to be able to daven properly because they're going to be weak yeah. from not having eaten, then it's better for them to eat a little something before they go to daven than it is to, uh, than it is to wait and not to daven properly. However, most people are not like that. I mean, you know, the, rea the rea reality is not like that. Yeah. You know, most people are perfectly capable of getting through a few hours worth of davening and then making kiddush afterwards, and I don't, I don't think people should be eating before they daven, unless, again, unless you have a particular reason. Maybe if someone gets a headache by not eating, drinking coffee. Po possibly, right? Um, some coffee. people, for example, if you're taking medication, mm -hmm. some medications have to be taken after you've eaten, otherwise it messes up your, uh, your, uh, you know, it messes up your intestines. So if that's the case, then for sure, if it's medication that has to be taken at specific times during the day. You know, sometimes some of these medications are they're pretty they're pretty strict. The, you know, the uh, the uh, so you have to take it in the morning, and you have to, so if you have to take it in the morning. Then you should eat eat a little something, the minimum requirement that you've got in order to be able to take the, the medication, and then you can go. Well, you could have coffee, right? Spoken like a Colombian. <laughs> <laughs> it's you've probably got well. coffee going through your veins, right? <laughs> well, not much, and not anymore. Ah, uh, no. Yes, yeah, what what happened? What happened? I have a problem with my stomach, so I want to be careful. I very soon drink coffee. Yeah? Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> what about water? Water? I mean, you can drink, you can drink water. If, again, if you, if you need to, you can drink water. But I see a lot of, you know, I remember uh, some of the Hasidic uh, Shtibla, they had coffee yeah. in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, listen, I mean, you know, whatever. Everyone everyone should do whatever's going to be best for them to do I mean, in order to be allowed? able to... Is it allowed or not? I mean, yeah, it's allowed. Again, try to avoid it. What you'll find is that most people are drinking it without milk. That's true. I mean, that's okay. But you say even to drink water before diving is bidi evid? I don't know, but I don't know if it's possible to define it as bidi evid exactly, but it's certainly not lechatrila. Maybe it falls in the cracks somewhere. Um, I don't. I don't think you know. I think we should. We need to get up and go to Shul and Dam. I don't think I can do anything without drinking water. Oh really? Parched. Then you should drink water. You so drink you should water. drink water. That's fine. Yeah, I just want to know what's the uh, halacha. Um, it's preferred that you don't. He right? said the rabbi. Yeah. You're davening. Yeah, you got that. It's just like one of the what's the halacha saying about it. Halacha yeah. says that it's preferred not to do it. Uh, halacha is it, it's better. It's better not to do anything before you go to, before you go to daven. Right, <clears throat> not to eat anything, not to drink anything. Again, if you need to drink water, because if you can't, if you you know if you can't function without having some kind of liquid inside of you, then uh, for sure you should you should take you know you should drink before you uh, before you go to Dublin. If you're like dehydrated or something. You should oh, that's for sure. Yeah. On that, there's no there's no question whatsoever. As somebody somebody's not feeling well, and uh, you know if you know you know you you know the symptoms well enough to realize that this is some form of dehydration, then for sure you you not only not only are you allowed to drink, you have to drink. Right, you got you got to look after yourselves. My boy, say. Take care of yourself. Okay. Yes. Can I ask you a question? Going back to the uh, main and the uh, for the phrase, the equivalent time, is that phrase the same as what is said after the three priestly blessings? Is that so? May it be? I think it is. Or can you hear? Amen. Can you hear us on? Yeah. That's really what Amen means. Ken Yiratzon, it should yeah. be your will. Okay. Oh, no, hold on a second. No, 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 I'm sorry. Ken Yiratzon is it should be your will. Amen is so be it. Two, two different things, okay. right? Amen, amen, the, the, I think really that Amen is really the, the uh, focus of Amen is it's true. Whereas Ken Yiratzon is may it be your will, which is this is neat. You know, we'd like this and maybe you could see your way to letting us have it as opposed to just Amen, amen is like a like a definitive statement, you know, amen, yeah, right, as opposed to Ken Yeratzon, which is more, more of a request. Yeah. Okay. That's why you'll see in many Sidurim, actually, at the end, of, for example, at the end of the, the priestly blessings, it says, amen, Ken Yeratzon, 
We've got them both, right? Because we're saying, yes, you know, it's a definitive statement, and Kenya okay, Tzal, it should be your will, and that's, that's what it should be. Um, okay, did, did, we, did we talk about heating up food on Shabbos? I can't remember if we did or yeah. we didn't. I can't remember what we did, yes? Yeah. I think so, right? like a, you have to put something special under it. So there's special oh, background. good. Okay, very good. Okay, so we did that. You come home, and you've got, of course, you've got to have cholent. If you don't have cholent, then there are all kinds of concerns that maybe you are karaite. We spoke about that, right? Okay, uh, Shabbos. Again, Shabbos day. You, you know, it's interesting. The Mishnah Brewer says like this: uh, during during the winter months, you've got to eat your Shabbos meal, the first meal on Shabbos. Eat the meal with the knowledge that you're going to eat another meal in a pretty short period of time, right? The third meal. Now, what, what's the thing? In, in the summer, you don't have to worry because there's a great big gap between the two, hours and hours and hours. Depending on where you live, you know, it gets longer and longer. Um, but in the winter, it's very short. And there's a problem in halacha. You'll be surprised to hear this, especially the yeshiva bochim here amongst us. You don't have to listen to this. It's got no application to your lives whatsoever. But there's something called achila gasa. Achila gasa is when you are just, eat, you know, you're, you're eating yourself, you're stuffing yourself to the point of no return. Right? You, I mean, you know, if you were a, if you were a, if you were a goose, if you were, sorry, if you were a duck, uh, pate de foie gras comes from a goose or a duck? Canard, no? Canard? Duck, goose, whatever. If you were a goose, if you were a goose, then by the time you finish eating on Shabbos, they would probably be, you know, ripping out your liver to be able to serve it up on somebody's, at somebody's meal, right? Um, says that, says the Mishnah Bro, when you sit down to eat your meal at Shalashudas at the third meal, you've got to be able to, you know, you've got to be able to want to sit down to eat it. So it requires a little bit of control. Now, again, for Yeshiva Bochim, who seem to have an insa insatiable appetite, um, it's really not a problem. They can eat and they can get up and they can eat again. It's like really no big deal. Um, I, I once witnessed with my own two eyes, actually with my own four eyes, I witnessed a uh, competition between two Yeshiva Bochim about, uh, it was a, a pizza eating competition. Who could eat more pizza? I mean, it was, it was pretty wild because they started off, right? They started off by ordering one pie each. A, one of these big things, a fam what's called a family size pie. Yes. Um, and uh, the, the, win the winner, he got his way through three and a half oh. family sized pizzas, wow. which I think is pretty impressive that myself. Is. How much did um, number two eat? Huh? How much did number two eat? I don't know, he, dro he dropped out at some point. I, I, I wasn't, it was like, what was their concentrate toppings? on the losers. What? What was their toppings on the pizza? You know, I don't remember the details that well. I just remember, you know, box after box arriving. It was quite something. Um, I also had a friend who told me that when he had, he had a, he did the opposite. He had a competition in yeshiva for a diet with one of his friends to see who could lose more weight in, the, in, the, in a month. So I said, who won? So he said, I won. He said, it was easy. He said, before the weigh-in, he drank two one and a half liter bottles of water and then weighed in. So he's now three kilos heavier than he was beforehand. And all he's got to do is go to the bathroom a few times and all of that liquid will have left and he'll have lost, he said he lost a lot more weight than the other <laughs> fellow. But so here, I'm, I'm giving you all the professional secrets now are being passed over to you. Um, let's talk about Shalashudas. When are you supposed to eat that third meal? The third meal is supposed to be eaten after you've davened mincha. Right, lechat chila, the optimal way of fulfilling the mitzvah of eating the third meal is after you've davened mincha. If that is not possible, then bidi eved, it is permissible to eat the third meal before you daven mincha, but it's not something that you should be doing if you can avoid it. What does a third meal have to comprise of? Again, optimally, lechatchila, you should be washing and you should be making hamotzi and you should be eating bread. If that is not doable, it's possible to fulfill your obligation of shalashudas by eating mazonas. Right, which is cakes, biscuits, crackers, pretzels, couscous, you name it, pasta, did I forget something? Muffins, probably, whatever, you get the idea. If that is not possible, <coughs> it is possible to fulfill your obligation by the Eved by using fruit, eating fruit for Shalashudas. And if that is not possible, it is permissible to fulfill your obligation by listening to Divrei Torah. Interestingly enough, right? So we spoke about 
the third meal being the most spiritual dimension of the meals, right? We, we, spoke, we spoke about that a while ago. And it's interesting that it's possible to fulfill the only meal that it's possible to fulfill your obligation through it by Divrei Torah is the third meal, which is the most spiritual meal that we're drinking. <laughs> sorry, that was a Freudian slip. We're, not that we're drinking, that we're eating. <clears throat> Right, so it's you know possible to fulfill your obligation in different ways. Like I said, though, the best way to fulfill your obligation is by davening mincha and then washing your hands and making hamotzi. Many why, shuls. Why, why huh? mincha first? Why because shalas shulis is really supposed to be eaten towards the end of Shabbos. It's really a technical thing, right? Mm. Uh, to be able to daven mincha at the right time, then you're supposed to be davening. You're supposed to eat shalas shulis afterwards. Right, because it's supposed to eat Shalash Shudas at the end of Shabbos. Shalash Shudas is supposed to stretch out into dusk and then into nighttime as well. Oh, so right? much so. Huh? I don't know that because you could theoretically... And th mincha, theoretically, you, mincha you, could, you could daven Mincha Gedola at you know, 12.30 and come back home and at 1 o'clock you can eat Shalash Shudas. And at 1.30 you can go to bed and wake up at you know, 5 o'clock in the afternoon and Shabbos is out. <laughs> 6 o'clock in the afternoon and Shabbos is out. Uh, you can definitely, you've definitely fulfilled your ob obligations. Lechatchili fulfilled your obligations, that's for sure. However, the according to the Kabbalists, the concept of, sh of Shalashudis is something which is supposed to go in tandem with Shabbos leaving. Right? And then in order to be able to do that properly, you have to daven mincha first. Yeah. yeah. Is do, uh, Divrei Torah, it, it's in a sitter. Do you, can you tell me where that is? What? Divrei Torah. No, Divrei Torah is, is words of Torah, which means it's not it's not a filler. It's, it's any. Yeah, you oh. you can you could sit around and you can talk about the Pasha, or you could tell over things that you've learned in class, or you could learn a, a you know learn Gemara together, right? And that is that that's able to fulfill your obligation. But the Eved, you're able to fulfill your obligation for Shalashudas for the third meal on Shabbos. How come right. words can come in place? Huh? Well, how come words? So I think again, the emphasis is like this. I, I, I think I think the pshat is that because that third meal is such a spiritual dimension, and again in the in the kabbalistic works, the the description of shalashudas is the it's like the it's the the it's the spirituality within the spirituality. You've uh, you've reached the the kernel of the spiritual dimensions of Shabbos. You're going to get there when you get to shalashudas to that third meal. Right, so because it is quite such a spiritual thing, it's possible to tap into the spirituality of the Torah and to use that to fulfill your obligation. And maybe that's chat why you can't you can't fulfill your obligation with the other two meals by speaking Divrei Torah. For the other two meals, you have to physically you have to eat something. Okay, just just one one last thing over here actually. Whilst we're talking about it, because it's got a halachic dimension to it. Um, this, this, this Shabbos is going to be Erev Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh is going to begin on Saturday night and Sunday. Right? Rosh Chodesh is the first day of the next month. So Rosh Chodesh Kislev is on Sunday. What is the halachic ramifications for us? So there is an Indian when you come to bench on, after you've eaten that third meal, according to some opinions, if it's already... Night time, very much night time outside. There is a question about whether you need to add in the prayer for Rosh Chodesh, Yale Viyavoy. That's why certain poiskim tell, they, they rule that on when Shabbos falls out on Erev Rosh Chodesh, it's correct to end Shalashudas a little bit before it gets dark and to bench in order to make sure that there are no questions whatsoever about what you're supposed to say. If you do it that way, then you recite Ritze, because it's Shabbos, and you don't have you don't worry about Yale Viyova because Yale Viyova is only going to begin. The prayer that's recited on Shchodesh is only going to begin once it gets dark. There are enough uh, authorities who rule that it's not a problem, and once it gets dark outside, you don't have to be concerned about reciting Yale Viyova. You're still in Shabbos, and therefore you can recite Bechas Amozen and you just say Ritze for Shabbos, and you don't have to say Yale Viyavoy. I don't know what the custom is over here in the yeshiva, what, you know, which one they follow. Uh, wherever you happen to be this Shabbos, and you, if you're wherever, you know, wherever you happen to be for the third meal, uh, just whatever everyone else does, it's okay. You've got who to rely upon, which means if they bench 
before it gets completely dark. So you should bench together with them. And if they bench after it's got completely dark, you can bench together with them as well. And you don't have to say, Yala Viola. Can you? Can you? I don't think you should, actually. But you may be by somebody who tells you that you should. And then just do what you're told. That's good practice for married life. What? <laughs> when, <For> you sure. <laughs> say, <laughs> when you say you should stop your meal before sunset, that can mean only no, not, bread? Not necessarily before sunset. Well, before, <clears throat> before before night time. Yeah. yeah. So sometime within mm -hmm. there. No, the Indian is like this. The, the, the problem. No, the, the problem over here is <laughs> you know what? Yeah. <clears throat> it, 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 it's a machlokes. According to most opinions, the problem over here is that once it becomes dark, so you when you bench, you have to say you, you might have to say yeah. yalla other. It's got nothing to do with whether you ate bread or not. Uh, there is a day, according to the Vilna Gaon, that if you eat bread, if you eat enough bread after it's got dark, so then maybe there is, maybe there is a real problem over here about, uh, about Yale Viavoy. So, you know what, maybe it's not a bad idea, even if you're eating by somebody and Shalashudis is stretching on, maybe it would be a good idea to refrain from eating bread once, once, it, you, know, once it's, when you look out the window and you see that it's, for sure, it's, you know, night is going to fall imminently. Um, then it would be a good idea maybe to uh, stop eating bread and just concentrate on the other things there instead. Like the people. <laughs> the company. Maybe not. Okay, the cake. You can concentrate on the cake instead. Okay, we're going to stop over here at Mitzvah Shem. And tomorrow, um, I think tomorrow we're going to have to take a look at Avdallah, which is, which is something which is really absolutely fascinating, actually. You know, whatever, Myriv and Avdallah, we'll take a look.